C Sharp 12 has introduced primary constructors, a new feature which has already caused controversy. There are so many questions about them. Am I using them right? Am I using them wrong? What is right? What is wrong when using uh, primary constructors? Is my class now looking like a record? Should my classes be looking like records now? So many tough questions. But questions, you know them. They have answers. And I will give you the answers in this video. Stay with me through the entire video and you will learn how to use primary constructors right, as I believe the right use of primary constructors, and what are the pitfalls that you should avoid when using them. There's a long way ahead, so please step into my office, I want to show you my code. I will start with a simple record class with two components. Records come with primary constructors already. Actually, primary constructors were introduced together with the records. I hope you have already grown accustomed to this convenient and readable syntax. Records define so-called product types. They are usual in functional programming, and as you can see, they have become a native part of C Sharp as well. The components are required and each component translates into a property with a public getter. I can access these properties and use them as needed. But how does this work under the hood? I will show you how the compiler handles a record with a primary constructor. You will use this same trick in your custom code later. This utility function prints out the non-public fields in an object. I want to see what fields exist there. Let me call it for the instance of this record. What will it print? Here the person type has two fields, both with a peculiar name. Those are the compiler generated fields, backing fields for the two properties that also the compiler generated in the record. And that is what the primary constructor did to this record. It generated two property getters and private backing fields C Sharp 12 now lets us do the same thing in our custom classes and structs. But remember, do the same thing as you saw in that record and nothing more. Don't be greedy, you will regret it. I will be designing a custom class that models a company department. There will be multiple attempts, hence the number in the class name. There will be several classes that implement the same request. Traditionally, we would expose public property getters for the object's components. That is a tradition in functional design. So you already see where I'm bringing you. I'm, I'm pulling you in the direction of functional design. If you plan to stick to the old-fashioned object-oriented design, then I think that primary constructors are not your cup of tea. And if you are unsure about what I just said, then watch this video next, uh, where I'm explaining how the C-sharp language is evolving and why it is evolving that way. Back to the code. The caller must initialize these components and we expose a traditional constructor. We all did this a million times over. There's nothing wrong with this, except that we did it a million times over. The code is redundant. The constructor is public, of course it is. For this class, of course. It initializes these components, of course. The entire constructor is reading the structure of the class again. It is redundant. To remove all these repetitions, enter primary constructors. The new class has the same components as the prior one. These variables are the class's parameters. This is the primary constructor. We use them inside the class to initialize components. And that is it. That is the primary constructor syntax. It has just removed redundancy. And that is all. <laughs> there is nothing more in them, really. And you should not look for more. Don't be greedy, you will regret it. I will show you how bad it can be if you abuse primary constructors. Look, 
All three types have the generated backing fields and nothing more. My class with the primary constructor looks the same as the record class. And again, that is all about primary constructors. I could end this video now, but I also want to show you what will happen, how bad it can become if you seek more than you can reasonably expect. The primary constructor's parameters scope is the entire type. You can use them as variables anywhere inside the class. You should not use them, I'm warning you, but you can if that is what you want. But where will the method take these values from? Oh, the answer is obvious, from inside the object, from fields, where else? The compiler will generate a private field to capture any parameter you use in any method inside the class. That is how that works. The last line in the output says that the class has two private fields. I didn't declare them, so it must have been done by the compiler. Why is this dangerous? What do you think? It is not just my impression that this code is dangerous, but also of other programmers, so I hear. Nick Chapsis has discussed this same problem in his video, and I will point you to watch that video as well. You will find the link to the video in the description. Here is the problem. There might be a class that provides behavior that applies to other objects. This method is supposed to find the best manager from multiple departments. That would be a service, and services often attract other services as dependencies that they need to complete their duties. To identify the best manager, we need a comparison criterion. Is it the revenue? Is it the, the employee churn? Is it blue eyes? That would qualify me as a manager. I have already told you that the scope of the primary constructor parameters is the entire class. That means I can use them freely inside any method. This code would apparently work, but with a caveat. Parameters are captured in fields that are read-write. I can change them. And now I've got myself a bug. I will strongly advise you against using primary constructor parameters for anything other than state initialization. Don't be lazy, you will regret it. I will try to help by capturing the parameter into a custom read-only field. That immediately awakens the compiler, which has reported a warning. What does it say? The compile time warning says that it has captured the parameter into the state and now I'm also using it to initialize a field. That makes sense. Let me check it out with a probe. I'm running it. And yes, two fields are defined on the class. This is the bug. So again, only use parameters to initialize the state to ensure that any issues of this kind will never happen. The warning is gone. In his video, Nick mentioned he would rather see read-only constructor parameters in the future. I like that idea, though that would open another issue. I will repeat the substance of primary constructors as I see them. Use the class parameters to initialize components the way records do. Not even read-only fields seem plausible to me, to be honest. But what is plausible? I have already pointed out that I see primary constructors as the tool of object composition. Functional programmers call that product types. If your type requires dependencies, services, then I'm sure that you will not be happy with using primary constructors. That is my opinion, at least. Then how do we use a primary constructor in a large class without making it look odd or, worse, cause bugs? It is the same thing again, a class with two properties. But here is the complication. The department must also keep track of its members. In an immutable design, the underlying collection will be an immutable list. And guess what? Nothing here is initialized yet. 
Members will always start empty and the public sequence returns the collection. It is only the declared type I change in this property getter. So the department members are now optional during initialization. However, the remaining two parameters are required. I will again use the primary constructor to request them. Before I complete this class, let me tell you that you can join the growing community on my Patreon page. That would give you access to the source code from this video as well as the source code from all other videos on my channel, but also the access to the Discord server and a preview to my future video courses. Come over, ask questions and take part in the discussions. Now back to initializing the objects. The funny part is that you can declare any additional constructors on the class with the primary constructor. But every single constructor you make must end up calling the primary constructor. The public constructor passes the sequence to the private one that receives an immutable list. That is a standard coding pattern in classes that contain immutable collections. This constructor has no choice but to call the primary constructor for the two required parameters. That is how a call to any constructor on the class or a struct invariably ends up calling the primary constructor when it is declared on that class or struct. This class can implement any behavior it finds useful. All mutations will be non-destructive here because this is an immutable class. This method allows the caller to add one or more members to the department without mutating the existing object. And now, two constructors will execute in this call, one always being the primary constructor. This, this is as far as I would go with primary constructors. If you try to push them further than this in your classes, I fear that you will meet their dark side soon. I hope that you will use primary constructors to simplify your code a little bit, but to simplify it, not to make it more cryptic or more dangerous or to introduce bugs. And if you wish to learn more about functional and object-oriented design, about immutable classes in the immutable design, then stay on my channel, subscribe and watch other videos like this one. See you in the next episode.